Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back, Rock the Stage Show, Sunday night, 7 p.m., back once again for a great, great, great show tonight. And this one kind of goes back to my childhood, but it also comes full circle to my adult career as well. Growing up, I loved the fall season. Uh, growing up, I loved, there were new TV shows. Uh, growing up, I can remember there was always a Friday night preview thing on every different network of the new shows coming up. And they would highlight what the action was going to be about, the stars were going to be out, who were going to be the, the best guests appearing on the show. And I drank it up like a kid. I love the idea of, Who's going to star where, where and why? But the big question after a while was, why did they pick them to do that role? What got them that job? What, what made them better than anybody else? Now, when you're in radio, when you're in TV and film, a lot of times they do a pilot, they test the chemistry. There's people that decide who's in and who's out. Tonight, we're going to get into that whole area, and I can't wait for this conversation because you're going to know the shows, you're going to know the characters, but we're going to go behind it, just a little bit deeper and deeper here tonight. With over 35 years in the business, Lori S. Wyman is an accomplished Florida casting director who has cast some of the largest blockbuster movies, commercials, and popular television series. You will know these shows and movies. Her career began back in 1980 when she started working as a casting director on, yes, Miami Vice with Don Johnson. And Lori has also written a book for actors that is sometimes referred to as the Bible for auditioning for actors. If that's not enough, she's here tonight on Rock the State Show. Welcome, Lori S. Wyman. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, Lori. That is like going down memory lane for me. Looking at your website, reading that Bible is like, I know that show. I know that show. But you're the one to help put the right people on at the right time very often, weren't you? Right. Yes. So, so I am considered a uh, location casting director. Yep. Because I'm in Florida, but I also do casting all over the Southeast. I, I base myself pretty much in Florida, but I'm all over the Southeast. I do casting. So we're known as the location casting directors. So I'm not the one that brings in the Bruce Willis or the Jack Nicholson or, the, you know, I, I don't, those people come in with right. the project and then we come in and we fill in a lot of blanks. I mean, and there's a lot because they just have so many leads and then we have to fill in everything else. I do uh, speaking roles. I do local, the little local roles one day, but mm -hmm. I also do uh, series recurrings, guest stars, Sometimes series regulars, depending on the show. So, and then for films, we do co-stars, we do bigger roles, people who work maybe several months to just a couple of days. So we run the gamut. So take us back in time because everyone loves movies and TV. Everyone would love to work in it, but we don't hear much about casting directors and know what you really do. So what is it that you do and what got you into this? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Thank you. So what got me into it was when I was a kid, you know, a lot of kids, they want to be an actor. I did school plays and, and, but, but to, to make that leap to actually do it, scary, very scary. And I knew I loved the business and I wanted to be around the business somehow. And right when I graduated from college, I graduated from the university of Miami with a degree in speech and communication. And what that degree prepares you for is basically nothing. Yeah, I've got one of them. <laughs> nothing or everything, but nothing. So uh, there was a local talent agency and they were putting feelers out. And they one of their actresses was a University of Miami professor. And so she put out um, an announcement in her class that the talent agency was looking for somebody to do filing and typing. That's where you got to start, right? Get in the door any way you can, emptying trash that, cans if you can. I say that all the time, any way you can. So uh, that was my first foray into this industry on this side. So I worked as a talent agent. Now, mm -hmm. 
I want to clarify the difference between a talent agent and a casting director because people confuse that all the time. As an agent, I represented the actors. Mm -hmm. A talent agent represents the actors. A casting director represents the production company, the producers. Yep. So the producers might hire me and say, we're looking for actors for this movie. And then I reach out to the agents and I get their actors. So, and there's no such term in this country as a casting agent. I hear that a lot of me. There's no, I'm not a, I don't cast agents. Yeah. I direct casting. So I'm a casting director. And then the people who are talent agents, they are agents for the talent. So that's- now let me, So interesting because you said you're mostly Florida based, Southern based. So there is a pool of actors that live in the region. So you probably do have some go-tos that you love the feature. I'm sure you'd have like a extra speed dial on some of those, correct? Yes. And that's probably easier than just blindly looking for anybody. You at least know some that you can pull in and say, they're going to hit it. They're going to be a rock star. And I trust them, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Now I'm not opposed to meeting new people. I'm always meeting new people, finding new people, seeing new people. And I, I go to theater and I'll see actors in a play. I'm like, oh, they're really good. I've met so many actors that way. But when I do a movie and I, I'm looking for, let's say, you know, detective. Yes. I mean, I know, you know, I know the 10 or 12 guys or girls that are yeah. the right ones. They they have the right look. They're they're going to make me look good. <laughs> so that's so mentioning that, you did a lot of cop drama action stuff. A I lot. mean, the, the, the shows are uh, just, in, I mean, Miami Vice alone. But, but you, I mean, you, you you worked on a TV series with Burt Reynolds back in the day. And again, now some of these shows flop and don't flop, which we're going to get into a little bit, but you were primarily a lot of cop action shows. Was that something you wanted or was that something that was kind of dropped on you by accident? Well, we did a lot of that down here in Miami. You know, Miami yep. is very popular with that. A lot of the, the Colombian drug lord, <laughs> you know, we did a lot of that. And I... I literally cut my teeth as far as casting uh, goes on the Miami Vice television series. That was probably the hardest television series I've ever cast. And I've cast a lot of television, oh, yes. a lot, a lot, a lot. But um, that was early on. And back then they did 22 episodes a season, which now they don't really do that many a season. And per episode back then they would go, 22, 27 characters per episode. Yes. And now financially, they just can't do that. No. Now it's 10. Yep. You know? Now it's a walk in the park for me now, but back then, and it was boom, 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 boom. I mean, it was, it was so fast paced, so intense. And so I, how I, do you stay ahead of that curve? Because I know writers, directors, set creators are always maybe a week, 14 days ahead of everyone, but they're always in production. It seems like, and you did 69 episodes, by the way, just, just for the counting. Oh. So how did you stay ahead of that? No, I've got Steve coming in this week. I've got Bob coming in two weeks. And I got to make sure the episodes are right when they land on the airplane. <laughs> I uh, I worked really hard. I, bet. I worked really hard and I worked consistently. There was a period of my career about a dozen years ago. I was doing five television series at the same time. I didn't realize one could do that. And that it was Burn Notice and Magic City and Glades and Graceland. And then I was doing at the time also the number one television series on Nickelodeon, which was a kid series. Yeah. Everything had to be so well orchestrated. It had to be a finely tuned machine. My casting for this was at this hour. My casting for this was at this hour. Monday and Wednesday was this. Tuesday and Thursday was that. You know, it was... It was, it was, I had notes and sticky notes and agendas and calendars. Everywhere. Yeah. So let's just drop a couple of names because it's fun. I mean, you have worked on so many, I mean, Bloodlines was an amazing run for you. Yeah. It blew up big time. Who, who are some of the people that you did select and say, I want you? And what made them so special and stand out from everyone else? I, I can try to verbally tell you that. I yeah. can try to use words, but when you see it, you know it. You know, it, it's uh, someone comes into the office, 
and you, you see the same audition over and over, the same dialogue, the same, and it's like, okay, 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 okay. And then someone walks in and you go, hmm? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they just, I remember doing BL Striker, which was the Burt Reynolds television series. Yeah. And I was looking for this one role. It was a pretty big role. And it was for a guy in his, let's say, 40s or so. And actor after actor after actor came in. And they were all good. They were all the same. They were all good. And then some actor comes in and he does it. And I, I like, oh, that's it. Like, you sit, you know. And I looked at the man, I go, could you do that again, please? And he said, okay. He was English, but I didn't want him to have an English accent. I said, could you do that again, please? He said, okay. What would you like me to do differently? I said, nothing. He said, well, why do you want me to do it again then? I said, because it was so good. I just want to watch it again. Well, you should have seen him puff up his chest. He was so proud. He was like, oh, okay. You know? Um, there's an actor now. He's a, he's a, he's a big actor. His name is Oscar Isaac and Oscar has done a lot of, a lot of, uh, projects inside Lewin Davis was, I think his breakout role, but Oscar took a class with me. I, I also teach classes. I teach actors yeah. auditioning for film and television projects. Yes. So Oscar was in, in the performing arts high school here in Miami. And he, uh, came in and took my class. And when I saw him, I said to myself, Oh, 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 this kid is phenomenal. And then I was casting a movie called uh, Big Trouble. It didn't, it wasn't a giant movie. It was with Tim Allen. I think it was yeah. Sofia Vergara's first big movie here in Miami. And Barry Sonnenfeld, who is a director, had a big name. Uh, he was a director. So I bring Oscar to come, I bring Oscar in to audition for a eh, little role, nothing major. And I loved him. I thought he was great. And he does his audition. And after he does his audition, uh, the directors were going over the people that he would like to book. And I thought Oscar was great. And he said to me, he goes, yeah, I didn't like him. I said, you didn't like him. I, I think he's wonderful. Nah. And then I said, and I knew this would get him. And I said it kind of flip. I went, well, he's good enough for Juilliard. And he goes, he goes <laughs> what? I said, yeah, he just got accepted to Juilliard. He goes, uh, let me see that tape again. So let's go back to Miami Vice for a second, because it wasn't just a cop show. It was an MTV movie with a cop show. So you had to find actors to fill the style that Michael Mann and everyone else was trying to come up with. Was that hard or that easy to, at that time, those videos were big everywhere. So that, that was a driving force. You had Phil Collins. You had so many different singer, actor types. How was it to fill those slots? Well, there was a casting director in New York, mm -hmm. and she was Michael Mann's person for those kinds of roles. Gotcha. And they, they were doing a maximum of five uh, guest stars. She was allowed to bring in a maximum of five. And then every other role. So if there were 27 roles that episode, wow. I did 22 of them. Um, back then, though, so that was the mid to late 80s. Yeah. Back then, Miami wasn't, people didn't realize that Miami had really, really good talent. Mm -hmm. And so they thought if an actor lived in Miami, well, they, they weren't that good. They didn't realize back then. Right. We did a lot of work. I did a lot of work on my own, making all these business trips to LA and pounding the pavement. We have actors here. We have, and people would say to me, you have actors in Miami? Like, <laughs> yes, it was, re it, you know, cause this, our industry is not that, that, that old, you know? Right. Yes. So, so the last 30, 40 years, we've really come into our own here in, in the Southeast mm -hmm. and we're considered now we're considered a really viable source of actors. Whereas well, then, Atlanta all the way down now is all filming everywhere. Oh, yes. From Atlanta all the way down, they're shooting everywhere. That's correct. That's correct. So it's big. I just cast a movie uh, that was shooting in Washington, D.C. And we uh, got a lot of actors in, you know, in that area, in New York, but Maryland and Pennsylvania and you know that, that region. You, you didn't call me. I oh. live in D.C. How did I not get the, how did I not get that call? <laughs> you might not have been the right demographic, I'm not sure. <laughs> now, I do want to go back to one of the 
show, and it, it is a personal favor of mine. Okay. Wise guy, Ken Wall, shot in Vancouver most of the time. But they made a change of actors and locations, and you were smack dab in the middle of that being in Florida when Wise Guy shifted to Hispanic storyline, new lead guy. Yes. What's it like to take over a ball like that? Because it was a huge hit, but it got turned kind of upside down. What was that like? Well, we had a great team. We had some great, great people. The producer was just the nicest man, one of the nicest producers I ever worked with in my entire career. Alex Beaton was his name. And we had phenomenal people on the crew. And uh, so it was, they, they, gave, they gave me an opportunity to cast a lot of people because like you said, it was kind of an Hispanic version. Yeah. Yeah. And we had such great Hispanic actors in South Florida. So I was so excited to be able to, I, that was, um, I think the fourth big show I went from Miami Vice to BL Striker. Yep. I did a couple of episodes of 21 Jump Street, which was shot in Miami. Yep. And then from there we went to Wise Guy. So those 21 Jump Street and Wise Guy was uh, Cannell Films, Stephen yes. J. Cannell. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was great. We just, I just love that. You know, I just, I love casting. I still love casting. Nothing makes me more excited than to find good actors and read with actors. I, I just love it. After all these years, I still absolutely love it. So to talk about the process because you love it so much, but, and it's changed now through COVID. The process has changed. I've talked to a lot of actors that we're now recording ourselves, submitting tapes at home, but it used to be they walked in so before a panel or something and they did lines, right? Yeah. Well, first they would do it for me. Yeah. Okay. So they came in, they would, they would, come in in front of me we would rehearse we would practice a little bit and then I would put it on tape um, my job is to see a lot of people mm -hmm. and narrow down to the best people for that particular role I have intel that the actors may not have um, <sighs> plus if I work with a producer and a director if I work with a production for a while I kind of get into the groove of what yes. they're looking for. I know this is this, they're too pretty. They're not pretty enough. They're too tall. They're too short. I know exactly what they're looking for. So, but when I see an actor's headshot and resume, I go, well, it could be, let's, let's see what they have. Um, I, I've had a lot of really wonderful actors that it's just not quite right or they're a little too comedic, or they're a little too serious, or they're, you know, whatever. So when I work with a production, I know what they're looking for. I know what they're looking for. And, and of course, because I've been doing it for so many years, I, I kind of settle into it pretty quickly. And well, so but now, oh, okay. So now they're doing self-tapes. Yeah, okay, yep. Here's the, here's the good and the bad about that. When you come in and you read in front of me, mm -hmm. you do an audition and mm, it's not quite right. I can right there on the spot. I can say, make it a little quicker, make it a little slower, make them a little funnier, make them more serious. So I can adjust you to go with what they're looking for. Right. But when you do a self tape, you don't have that. You don't have my feedback right then. And that's what several actors have told me. They said, it's hollow. I'm by myself. I really don't know what they're going for. I can't read their faces and the mannerisms. Because sometimes they're reading you as they're doing their line, but they also know crap. I got to go back and redo something better than that. So they want number two. With the tape, they don't know any of that stuff, do they? No. No. So what I often do, which I, I think helps a little bit, I always say, do two takes two different ways. So one of them is a little more serious. One of them might be a little lighter. Yeah. If you do two takes, two separate way, two different ways, yep. and you make individual clips. So don't, don't join them together because if you join them together, I can't edit it. Well, and this is getting into your Bible of auditioning book for the actors, which is fascinating. Thank now you. there's another area and I've talked to several actors and sometimes they say you have to learn your sides. Others have said, have your sides in the back pocket because they may even have changed the script, give you a new iteration of it. You may need to. So which way do you go when you coach them 
in your coaching side of your business when it comes to sides and preparation and walking in. So this is what I always say. You must always, always, there's no conversation. You must always be memorized. And you must also always be flexible enough to be able to change it. But you must be memorized because what you don't want is you don't want to be holding your sides. Let's say you're not memorized. So you 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 depend on them a little bit. You don't want to be doing this. Yep. No. <laughs> every time you look down, it takes you out of the out of the character. Yep. And and if you're doing something really serious and you're 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 really into it and you're you're doing and you're you're telling them and I just want to tell you how much I, how much I, you know, it, it just, it just cuts it. It breaks it. You know what I mean? It, it, it yeah. ruins it. So I say you must all, I've watched thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands at this point of auditions. Oh. The people who are doing this and then break character because they have to look down because they forgot. And then they, it, you need it to flow. You need to be in the character. Even if you're not a hundred percent word for word, go for it. Just do it. That's, yes, own it. Right? You, yes. you, you, you have to walk in the room and own it. That's right. Now, when it comes to because it, you're you're meeting them first coming in, the first glance, everything else. As the process rolls on, they often have to meet with their co-star or someone they're going to do a major scene with to check that chemistry. We talked about way back to the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. Are you involved with that, or is that more? higher level evaluation or, or do you all get in that together? No, I don't. I don't. Um, every, every once in a while, if, if the actor, it happens to be in town, sometimes they bring them in together. Like I've done it in my office where we bring yeah. people in to see if they can, you know, mesh. But usually when there's that level, because the people that I, that I cast usually are not, that high stakes yep okay um, or or it's not it's not crucial but sometimes what they'll do they do uh, a read through before mm -hmm. the shoot yeah. so everybody sits around the table or or of late everybody is around the zoom and so they uh you know they match they they interact that way and sometimes they have recast based on those read throughs and based on yeah i've seen that so now you also have won a couple of different awards here, but both the audio it's, it's it's the Ardios Award. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us about that. Be that popped up several times. What exactly is that, and how do you earn it? Okay, so I'm in an organization called the CSA, which stands for Casting Society of America, mm -hmm. and it's it's the casting. Uh, organization like directors have the DGA, the Directors Guild, the Writers Center. Mm -hmm. So the CSA is our um, is our organization, and you have to get letters of recommendation. You have to have so many years of credits on 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 screen, on etc. And then within our organization, we have an award called the Ardios Award. And the Ardios Award is like our our little Oscar, if you will, and. Um, so I've actually been nominated for that eight different times out of Florida, but um, I I work in conjunction with the LA casting director or the New York casting director. So they're the main casting director. I'm the location casting director, mm -hmm. and I've won it twice. That's nice. No, I mean, not everyone can win that. I mean, that to me is like a big cherry on top of everything you've done and accomplished. Have, have you ever thought about Continuing to level up and actually direct, produce, do anything outside of this casting director role that you've done? Um, I think I'd be a really good producer because I'm really good with money. You know, like I'm very, that's the, the producer is the money person. And yeah. I've actually saved producers lots of money just because I can't stand waste. And I remember doing a, a television series once and they were paying their actor, their uh, guest star actors, uh, $50,000. And I just, yeah, 50,000, not, I mean, for the show, but it was only a couple of weeks, but they were paying right. that. Yeah. And I just thought, that's too much. That's yes. Much. So I, they had asked me to make the deal with the, with the guest star that was coming in. And I was talking to the agent and I offered them 25. Oh, and they, they balked at that and they bucked me and they, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. In the end, 
I made the deal for 25. So I go to the producer and I said, okay. He goes, did you make the deal? I said, yes. He goes, so what, what is it? I said, we're paying her 25,000. And the producer said, what did you say? I said, we're paying her 25. He said, but I said, it just didn't seem right. And he said, oh my gosh, I should have you make all the deals. You know, because because I, I know when I was an agent, I loved making the deals. Of course, I was on the side that I was trying to get more money, you know, but yeah. I, I'm good with that. That's so, so that's, so because of that, I think I'd be a good producer. I'm, I'm like good with organization and financial. And so, but you know what? I just love, I love casting and I love working with actors directly. So instead of doing producing or director, my yeah. offshoot, if you will, I've done uh, actor mentoring mm. and I have, I teach auditioning uh, yep. skills. Yeah. So that's what I, that's my, my side hustle, if you will. Now, now I'm going to go all the way back to Miami Vice because, okay. but I want to switch it to your personal life because if I'm right, you met your husband on Miami Vice. How cool is that? I did. I did. <laughs> I did. I did. How did um, that go down? Well, honestly, I met him, I guess, somewhere in the 1980s, uh, brought him in to read for something. Don't exactly quite remember meeting him exactly but um but we but we met <laughs> and then um he uh he was good he what a phenomenal another there are actors that come in that i go oh they they have the it factor yes he had, he had the it factor he had a very very lucrative career so he had the it factor and we were just friends like superficial friends you right. know i'd see him i knew when i brought him in he was going to make me look good and then we I were we were friends like that for a few years actually mm -hmm. and you know one thing led to another a group of people got together and during a hiatus a vice hiatus over christmas time you know let's go out and let's do this and i don't know about 10 of us and uh, that's it. And <laughs> that was it. From and, all there you go. And here we are so many years later. So yeah. also, this is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month that we're celebrating. Right. Yes. Uh, for those who have been tracking me on social media and stuff, you know I'm talking about the International Stutter Awareness. They both happen to be going on in October. But we bring this up because, Lori, you went through breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And you have a a pretty interesting story. I, I would love if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what you went through, but also the fact that after all that was done at age 45, you have a child. So you've got a couple of cool stories. Can you share some private stuff? Yeah. Sure. So I'm going to take it back to Mark, my, my husband. Yeah. When we were dating, every time I'd book a month or before, we, before I was dating, when we were just, um, we just Friends, knew each other. Colleagues. Professionally. Yeah. Um, he would give me little like thank you notes or thank you gifts when he would book something. So one of the gifts that he gave me was a book and it was called Confessions of a Kamikaze Cowboy written by an actor named Dirk Benedict and Dirk oh, Benedict yeah. was on a team. And, and yeah, so, and Dirk, and I didn't read books. I wasn't like a book reader kind of thing. So I'm like, I, I read a script every week, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot going on. So um, he gave me this book written by an actor and it was a story of how Dirk Benedict was diagnosed with, um, uh, I want to say it was prostate cancer. I think it was prostate cancer okay. and how he cured it naturally through something called macrobiotics. Wow. And I read this book. I actually read it. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to be macrobiotic. That was that it resonated with me mm -hmm. one day this, and, and put the book away. And this is before I dated Mark or anything. I read this book. This, this is going to be me. Now, fast forward, Mark and I are married and um, I, I find a lump and they say, you know, they say you should check yourself. National Breast Cancer Awareness Month here. Yep. Make sure you check yourself. And, you know, it's a very curable disease if you catch it at the beginning, you know, it, once it gets out of control, then you're in trouble. Right. So I find out that I've got this, this malignant lump. I didn't think it would be malignant, but it was after I had uh, a lumpectomy and the doctor's like, okay, you know, like they get into medical mode, we're going to do chemo, radiation and a double mastectomy. And I said, no. 
that doesn't resonate with me. I'm going to become macrobiotic. And this doctor looks at me like right in the face and he goes, don't be stupid. <laughs> As he said. And I looked at him and I said, I won't. And he said, I'm a Harvard fellow. And I said, uh-huh. And he said, you need to listen to me. And I said, it's my body. And Mark, God bless him, we were married. God bless you, Mark. He cooked for me. He went with me to this macrobiotic institute in the Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts. And so I really kicked it into gear and I focused. And, and, and people were understanding, you know, when people say, oh, let's go out for ribs. I was like, yeah, I can't do that anymore. You know, let's go out for uh, hot fudge Sundays, And I think, mm, can't do that anymore. Let's go out and kick back a bunch of beers. Mm, can't do that anymore. You know, and that was my choice. And um, I share about this a lot when yeah. I talk to actors, when I speak. I had a, a woman come in my office one day. Her son was a little actor. And she came in. She was the mother, right? And she pulled me aside. She said, I heard, your, I heard you talk about your breast cancer journey. And she said, my sister had stage four breast cancer. The doctor gave her three months to live about three years ago. And I did what you said. She's fine. Yes. And there's so many stories that I don't know because I do a lot of lecturing. I do a mm -hmm. lot of shows like this. Right. I do my own shows. I do stuff like this. You never know who's listening. You never know who's going to hear you. Well, but and, I, and, and, and then beyond that, you have... A child, age 45. I know. Now, you're not supposed to do that. Were you told you're not supposed to do that? <laughs> well, I never, I had never been pregnant in my life. Um, and uh, I was a career woman. Mark right. was a career guy. I mean, we were career people. We picked up and traveled. We didn't have dogs. We didn't have anything. You know, we had no restrictions. And um, and at the at that ripe old age, but because I completely cleaned out my system. Right. And I was so healthy. All of a sudden, I go, uh, I, I look at that little, the, you know, that little, that little eat, that little at home pregnancy test. I'm like, uh oh, uh oh, what's that? Greatest, greatest uh, miracle in my life. But then you, you, you took your child to set, to office, to, to different things. Anyway. She was, she was a part of your life. And you brought her to work as a part of life. Very cool. She, Very when cool. she was something like 10 or 12, one of the people who was supposed to work for me that day didn't come in and I needed someone to sit in the front of the room and, you know, you're next and you're next and make sure you sign in. I had this little kid sitting in the front of the room and they all, they all listened to her because she, she took command and they thought she was so cute, you know? <laughs> yeah. Lori, this has been fantastic. I do want to make sure we do show your website and on our website, you're going to find movie, commercial, film, TV, after TV. You're going to go, I know that. I saw that. I saw that. Go check this out. But what other things do you have on your website? Uh, on that, that's my casting website, Lori Wyman Casting. Yep. And uh, gosh, some of the projects uh, of the last few years, Bloodline, yes. Ballers, um, uh, Dolphin Tail 1 and 2, a great yep. kids movie, yep. Recount for HBO, Recount. I One of my Audios Awards uh, was for Recount. I was nominated for an Emmy. That that picture right there is uh, at the Emmy, on the red carpet of the Emmy Awards in Los Angeles. Yeah, that was, uh, that was fun. You know, that was so much fun. Uh, it's been a really, really fun career. It's been a great career. It's a, it's, it's, I put in a lot of work showing up at yes. seven, five in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. I mean, some dreadful hours. Um, you got to be passionate about it. If it's something that you want, if it's something that, that somebody wants, you've got to go all in a hundred percent. I, I, my daughter wants to be an actress and I said, Oh, you're getting into the family business here. Are you? <laughs> she just graduated uh, with her BFA in acting. And I, and I asked her, I said to her, is this something you really want to do? And she said, yes. I said, you really want to do it? And she said, yes. I said, then you're all in 100%. I said, and you're in until you're not anymore, anymore. You're in 100%. And that's what I recommend to my actors that I coach. You got to jump in with both feet, whatever, whatever your passion is, whatever yeah. your career is. You can't do it halfway. 
you have to really go over and above because a lot of people don't. So if you do, if you go over and above, already you're going to be ahead of the game. So yeah. that leads me to the final question of tonight, but it sets it up okay. very, very, very well. Okay. What's the best one piece of advice you give somebody, an inspiring actor, let's get the call. They're going to go do their first audition. What's their, what's the best first audition advice you can give them? First of all, follow the directions, read everything, know what they're telling you to do. You know, if you have any questions, ask. I was always taught there's no such thing as a stupid question. Definitely a stupid mistake, yes. but no, no such thing as a stupid question and go for it and go for it with, with, with all of your heart. Just go for it and know that we want you to be good. We want you to be good because if you're good, hey, we can cast our role. Everybody's there for you. Do not feel that, you know, that people are, are not on your side. It, it's nothing personal. It's not. Do not take things personally. We want you to be good. The better you are, the better our production looks. So now you have to, you forced me to ask you a bonus question because that okay. was an incredible answer. I'm landing the plane right there. But I've heard you say you need to have hope in this business. You talk about hope as one of the powerful forces. And you try to encourage your students, your actors that you work with, be hopeful and confident because of the other side of the table is cheering you on. But they don't know that, do they? No, they don't. They get scared. They if if somebody if somebody looks down at their phone during an audition, they think they don't like me. Yeah. If they look at their watch to see what time it is, they think, "Oh, I'm bored." They and you know what? No, that's not the case at all. I remember doing a big movie, Marley and Me. Remember Marley and Me? Oh, great movie. No, great movie. And I remember sitting in the room, and one of the producers was in the room, and for the most part, they were on their phone. Most they were on the couch in the back, and the actress would walk in, and they would do, and then they go right back to their phone. Mm -hmm. And so, if if the actor was watching that person, they said, "Oh my god!" They didn't know who they were, right. but they they said, "Oh my gosh!" They they're not looking at me. They're not paying attention to me. They don't. And I thought the same thing. Honestly, I'm sick. I'm, I said, "Well, why are they here? They're not even watching my casting," you know. And let me tell you something. At the end when the whole casting was over and what you do is what we did that day. Anyway, you take the headshots of all the actors and you put them on the floor. You know, we put them on the floor. Sometimes yeah, yeah. I had this big wall, we'd put them up on the wall. <clears throat> and there was a role of, of a girl in a bathing suit on the beach, one of the roles and the director and the other casting director and I were talking about who we liked better. Mm -hmm. That girl who I, who I thought absolutely was the right character, that girl or somebody else, and the producer who had been sitting on the couch the whole time looking down at their phone looks up and says, I like the girl with the turquoise shirt and goes right back down. And I thought, yes, that's exactly who is, that's exactly who should be cast. So they were watching the whole time. They were paying attention the whole time. So you never know. You just never know. And I always say, don't take no for an answer. You know, if you can't get in the door, go in the window. If you can't get in the window, go down the chimney. But by gosh, keep going. Going as a typist secretary, and you may find yourself doing other great things, right? Yep. Lori S. Wyman. Remember the name. Go check out her website. Lori, it's been great having you here on Rock the Stage. Thanks for taking the time today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, another great show tonight. And again, we're always back every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time with more guests, more insights. We go from Hollywood to authors to you name it. They're here going around the world now on 19 different uh, countries around the world and streaming in over 200 plus episodes and much, much more still coming. So thanks for being with us tonight. Make a comment, add a comment, add a like, add a share. Come back here at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. Eastern time for another edition of Rock the Stage next Sunday night.